Thanks. Um, so we'd love to uh, just quickly tell you how DonorsChoose.org came about. Um, and uh, then we're going to show you the front end of our website and explain what's going on uh, at the back end, uh, explain a few uh, technology-powered ways that we're bringing donors to our website, uh, and then ask for your help um, in spreading the word uh, and in helping teachers and students. So uh, just to let you know how DonorsChoose.org came about, it was at a public high school in the Bronx where I was a social studies teacher uh, for five years. And my colleagues and I saw our students going without the books, without the art supplies uh, that they needed to learn. Uh, we would come up with an idea for a field trip. Uh, we would think of an art project that just needed certain supplies. We would come up with a science experiment that we wanted to conduct with our students but needed certain lab materials. And none of these ideas could come to life because there, were, there was no funding source. We couldn't innovate. We couldn't bring our best ideas for projects, for resources uh, that our students needed. We couldn't bring them to life. Uh, and in fact, uh, just to underline the, the issue here, uh, public school teachers in the United States spend, on average, $500 out of their own pockets on school supplies. Uh, and if you can imagine an average $30,000 teacher salary, which after tax is maybe 24,000 bucks, spending $500 of that on the copy paper and the pencils and, and some of the basic supplies that your students don't have, that's a really big deal. And so while my colleagues and I were griping about that state of affairs and talking about all these projects we would do if only there were, there were funding, um, I figured that there were all these people who wanted to help improve our public schools, but as John said, we're getting skeptical about making a donation that kind of feels like you're, you're just throwing something over the wall. I felt like people were getting skeptical about writing a $100 check to a charity and feeling like it went off into a black hole, uh, not being able to choose uh, a, a project that they could bring to life, not really seeing their dollars at work, not hearing back from the people whom they chose to help. Uh, so I figured if, if we could create this website where public school teachers could post classroom projects in need of funding, and where donors could come and choose the classroom project that really spoke to them personally, and see where their money was going, know that their dollars were spent as designated, and hear back from the classroom in thank you letters and photographs, then uh, I figured my colleagues and I would be able to go on that field trip and give our students those books and do that art project. So I created this, this rudimentary website. Um, uh, teachers at my school started using it, started putting up projects that ranged from uh, a set of Baby Think It Over dolls, which are life-size, life-weight dolls that cry at three in the morning and show a teenager what it would be like if they had a kid, to a set of SAT review books, to a quilt-making project. Uh, and with my colleagues starting to put up projects, um, my students volunteered after school every day, uh, and they hand-wrote letters to people all across the country telling them about this website where somebody with $10 could get the same kind of choice and accountability and transparency that, uh, that a millionaire gets when they're making a huge gift. Uh, so that is, that's how the, the website came into being. For our first few years, we operated uh, out of my parents' apartment and out of my classroom. Uh, my students were our staff members uh, for years one, two, and three. Um, and we expanded only bit by bit. At first, we were open to uh, New York City public schools. Uh, then we opened to North Carolina, then to Chicago, then to the Bay Area, bit by bit. Um, and only last year, uh, a group of Silicon Valley leaders got together. It was uh, Vinod Kosla of Kleiner Perkins, um, David Philo, the co-founder of Yahoo, uh, Piero Midyar, the founder of eBay, uh, Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix. They, they formed a group and provided the funding for our website, for DonorsChoose.org, to open to every public school in America. So we're now national, uh, and that's in, in good part why we're really psyched to, uh, to be here and to be showing you our website. Uh, so I'm Oliver. I'm the DonorsChoose.org CTO. So uh, the only way I know how to talk about what we do is to show you guys a demo um, really quickly of how it works. So uh, up on the screen is a DonorsChoose.org homepage. Uh, you're, if you're a user, a prospective donor, you show up there. And if we get really lucky, you might like the first project you see. You click on the big red button, 
and uh, you're off to the races. And with just a few clicks, you give us some info, and you input your credit card number, and that's it. You've just uh, helped fund a classroom project and bring it to life for that teacher and uh, their students. What I wanted to also show you, as you can imagine, some donors, uh, prospective donors, as Charles mentioned, really like wrapping their heads around exactly uh, what type of project they're going to support. And so we provide a lot of information uh, for donors to make the best decision and, and find the project that inspires them the most. Uh, so for example, uh, someone might drill into a specific project, and this is an example of what they'd see. Uh, this is a, uh, um, uh, you see sort of front and center is a picture of the classroom that was uploaded by the teacher. Uh, the text in the middle is an essay that was written by the teacher explaining uh, what they need and why and, and how they'll put it to use. Uh, and of course, in the upper right is in, uh, an indication of how much money they need and how much money they've already received. Uh, most projects are funded by multiple donors coming together. And uh, what I wanted to call your attention to is if you look on the, uh, the left column, uh, you'll notice sort of a whole bunch of metadata that we have around each project. Uh, so for example, we know what the poverty level is uh, in that classroom. We know what grades are being served by that classroom. We know how many projects that teacher has gotten funded, uh, DonorsChoose.org. This teacher is, seems to be extremely prolific, uh, making great use of the site. And you can see she's had uh, 25 projects uh, brought to life through the site already. Uh, and uh, thank you, punctuality, something I'll get to later. You also see um, some sort of taxonomic designations with regard to what subject is this in. So they've indicated this is a, a math-oriented project, uh, the type of resource that are being received, and a whole bunch of other metadata, when it was submitted, when it expires, how many students will be impacted, how many instructional hours it will deliver, uh, and whether the resource is reusable. That's the, the uh, will it be used by future students. And uh, w what I uh, also will show you is that in, in the case where we have a photo for safety reasons, which is something we're very conscious about because we're dealing with teachers and students, of course, uh, we don't show very specific uh, uh, location information. So at the lower left, you see it just says North Carolina. Uh, but some donors, as you might imagine, uh, care very deeply about uh, which zip code they're giving to or, or even which specific school. Uh, so for them, we make all that information available. So I'm just switching to another project uh, where there's no photo. And in turn, in the lower left, you see exactly where, uh, this informa where the, the, the project is coming from and where the resources will go. Uh, so this is a East Palo Alto school with a 95% high poverty rate. It's actually a charter school as well, which you can see there. Uh, and in addition, one of the things we like to do for our donors uh, is provide really granular detail on where exactly the money is going. So uh, you can see we have this thing called the project cost report, which is essentially an itemized, uh, call it almost an invoice or a pre-invoice, indicating exactly how the money will be spent. So you click on it, it's a PDF, uh, and it would look like this. So for that project, uh, the resources that the teacher is looking to bring into the classroom are all uh, laid out here, item by item. You can see the vendor that they're coming from, the price, the quantity. Uh, and I'll scroll down, and you can see all the extra information that you would expect to see, the shipping charges and the tax and payment processing fees um, and so on. Now I'm going to do uh, the, the, the uh, part of the demo that everyone says you shouldn't do, but uh, it's where you ask the crowd to suggest a, uh, ask the audience to suggest a search term, uh, because you know at, at all times we have about uh, between 12 and 13,000 projects live on the site. Uh, so we we actually have some long tail properties going on, and a lot of our donors uh, can search for very specific things uh, that are meaningful to them and find them. So, cross my fingers. Does anybody have a, a search term that I can put in and see if we can find a um, a project that would meet that criteria? Let's try that. So there are five. Actually, this was filtered because I was uh, looking at a Bay Area project. So in, just in Northern California, there's five projects um, matching those criteria. And if we uh, dig into them, um, we could learn more about them. One thing that our donors uh, enjoy doing is, in addition to just keyword search, they're able to uh, make use of all that metadata that I showed you before and do very specific structured searches using that information as well. So uh, what we just searched for, actually I, I accidentally had the Northern California filter on, as you can see down here, uh, was uh, poetry projects in Northern California. But a donor could also uh, say, well, you know, I'd like them to be in these uh, specific subject areas. 
Uh, or I would like, you know, I, I'm, today I'm feeling generous. I'd like to spend between $100 and $200. So they could indicate that preference. They could also uh, indicate the type of resource they'd like to fund, whether it's supplies, a trip, or technology. They'd say, I might want to pile on a project that already has some money attached to it. Uh, they can pick the grade level that they'd like to fund. And they can also indicate, for example, that they might want to find a classroom that has a high level of need. We give them uh, very granular controls over geography for a lot of folks. Uh, giving in their community matters a lot. Uh, or giving in another specific community, for example, hurricane impacted communities um, is important. So uh, a donor could drill into just Northern California or all the counties uh, therein. Or they could say, you know, I'd like to give to someone who is from Teach for America. Or they could say, I'd like to give to a magnet school or a charter school uh, or even um, a special education project. What we do uh, after the donation takes place is that uh, for every donor, almost like your E-Trade account or like your B of A or Wells Fargo online account, we have uh, sort of a donor profile that just they can see. And we tabulate for them uh, all of the students that they've impacted, all of the hours of learning that they've enabled. Uh, we give them links back to all the projects that they've funded. They can review the cost report for any of them. And then we also do some slicing and dicing of all that data you saw before that we have for each project. So for example, uh, in this first graph, the donor can see uh, the, the distribution uh, by need of their gifts. Below that, they can see uh, we've cut the data by the amount of dollars against the grade level, and then also against the subject area. And in addition, we provide them with geographic information. Uh, for the privacy of our donors, I didn't want to pull up just any random account. So this is, in fact, Charles' account. And uh, uh, as you can see, most of the giving is centered in New York City. What we also do with this same data is we aggregate it and roll it up across all of our donors. And this is just on the website for anyone to see. And we recrank the numbers every day. So uh, what you can see is, as of today, uh, in fact, a very cool milestone happened just a couple days ago. We crossed the $20 million mark, uh, total amount of resources delivered through DonorsChoose.org to uh, teachers and their students. And when you think about the average project size being about $400 and being funded by multiple donors coming together, uh, you realize this is sort of real micro philanthropy at work. So you can see there the total dollars, total number of students impacted. Uh, you can see our year over year growth. Uh, in the early years out of Charles Classroom, uh, we did a lot less donation revenue uh, that we've been able to do in the last 24 or 18 months. And the same stats are here as well. You can see 46,000 projects funded, the breakdown by need. Uh, the breakdown by uh, the same slice and dice I showed before, having to do with grades and, and uh, subjects. And you can also see here where the donations are coming from. And this is state by state, so I don't want you guys to think that there's somebody in, in um, San Luis Obispo who's just doing all the heavy lifting for California. This is, that, that big circle is uh, all of California rolled into one. And this same information, what, can actually be sliced by region. So I can zoom in and say, hey, for Northern California, which is a region we've been in for a couple years now, what's the impact been of DonorsChoose.org? And here's all the same information, but just for Northern California, primarily the Bay Area. And I would say that, that uh, in addition to the choice, uh, accountability, and transparency, we provide the donors. Without question, the coolest part of the DonorsChoose.org experience for someone who's giving is what we call the thank you packet. And the way this works is that uh, after the project is completed, a packet is sent from uh, the classroom to, uh, through us, to the donor. And it, it's really quite impactful. I brought one with me today to show you guys. And what it contains is, uh, this is sent to, to the donor. And it's got uh, an impact statement from the teacher saying how the project went and how the students uh, reacted to it. Uh, it also has the cost report I showed you earlier, sort of with the itemized breakdown of where the money went. But you know, probably most impactful are uh, every teacher includes pictures of the kids doing the project. Uh, and then every kid in the class writes a handwritten thank you note uh, indicating you know, their gratitude to the donor for their gift. And uh, this is really a powerful part of the process. As you can imagine, a lot of people get this, go back and give. And uh, I think what it does, in addition to really creating a personal connection between the donor and the classroom, is it's a real strong sense of accountability. Uh, it's, there's a pretty darn good chance this project really happened if you're getting a letter from the teacher and thank you notes from the students, and you're seeing pictures of them with the resources in hand. 
So this, for the donors, we try to make this a very simple and easy uh, experience, right? This is the consumer web, and people have a lot of things they could be doing, and uh, we, we just want to make this seamless and, and easy. But behind the scenes, there's a ton of work we do to enable this. Uh, we, we call it sort of the general category of ensuring the integrity of the philanthropic marketplace. And one analogy we like to make with our small uh, charitable organization, which is obviously a bit of an aspirational analogy, is that uh, we think we're sort of Craigslist or, or an eBay type on the front end, because we're trying to make a market between uh, teachers and donors. But in the back office, we're, we're a little bit more like Netflix, uh, which is that we actually have a lot of real deal stuff and fulfillment effort that's going on there in order to make the marketplace work. So for example, uh, we screen and price every single project that goes up on the site. Uh, that means that uh, we've confirmed it's a real teacher at a real school. Uh, and also, by uh, validating the pricing, we've made sure that if a donor says, I'm giving $350, that it's not just a guess from the teacher that that's what it takes, and that they might find out the hard way two weeks later that they actually need $450. We've priced it out, so we know that $350 is the right amount to bring that project to life. We also do all of the purchasing in our back office. We're not just firing off checks to these teachers. So uh, we have a team that is, is getting the resources and getting them delivered to every classroom. So one of the things I wanted to show you was, uh, for example, what that user experience looks like for the teacher. When a teacher is putting together a project after they've written the essay and, and indicated some basic information, uh, they actually, through our site, go into um, what I might call kind of a multi-vendor shopping cart experience, where they're browsing around through about 36 vendors that we make available. And they're picking out the stuff they need. Uh, this is, does two really uh, powerful things for the marketplace. One, as I mentioned, we know the pricing's real because they've actually found the items and we've gotten the data from the vendor electronically. What it also does is at the point where the project is funded and it's time to deliver the resources, well, we have a manifest of exactly what needs to be ordered. Behind the scenes, uh, there's a fair amount of work that even takes place after the project is funded, uh, which includes, for example, distributing these purchase orders to all these vendors, keeping track of the order status. Uh, you know, hopefully something didn't get back order, something didn't go missing. Uh, we then get invoiced by all of these uh, vendors, and we have to reconcile those invoices against the, uh, against the actual purchase orders, and then we have to pay them. So I mention all this you know, not because it's the most sexy stuff in the world. In fact, it's really not. Uh, and, and I think if you told Charles and, and if you told me that, that part of DonorsShoes.org, when we first got involved, was going to be becoming near experts in e-procurement and electronic invoicing, uh, we wouldn't really, uh, we would have been very surprised. But the, the, the main message is that uh, to do this right and to really ensure that the resources get delivered and to have integrity in a philanthropic marketplace, uh, we found that we needed to move this far down the supply chain in order to make sure that the classrooms really got what they needed and, most importantly, perhaps, that the donor who has made a commitment with their money is getting what they paid for. Another part of our back office operation is processing the thank you packets that you saw. So, of course, we're not sending the teachers a donor's address. So what we do is we send the teacher a kit. They take pictures with a disposable camera. They have the kids write the thank you notes. These are com coming back through our office. We then process them, get the film developed, and route those back out. Now, one classroom project may have five donors. So we're then sending that out to all five donors. So we actually have close integration with the US Postal Service. Uh, fortunately, there's a large office uh, uh, of the Postal Service right near ours. But every day, we have uh, these guys from the USPS walk into the office with a huge hand truck and dump uh, you know, a lot of mail in our office, which is the feedback packets coming back from the teachers. All of this, uh, in addition to uh, uh, getting the resources where they need to go and getting the thank you packets into teachers' hands, does a couple important things for the marketplace. And, and uh, as you guys know, uh, sometimes there is an unseemly kind of underbelly to what happens on the internet. Sometimes there is some fraud, and there's some folks who might not play by the rules. And what a lot of these measures do is give us uh, a basic level of kind of anti-fraud. So for example, by screening the projects, by associating the teachers with known schools, by doing the purchasing, uh, by only shipping to addresses of schools that we get from the government, 
uh, we're able to really ensure that you know, no funny business is happening. One other thing we do is when, a, when resources go to a school, we send uh, an email to all the teachers at that school who are using DonorsShoes.org and say, you know, great news, new resources are on the way, which uh, ostensibly is to uh, uh, you know, increase awareness and help make sure that the stuff gets where it needs to go, but it also uh, creates awareness that might discourage someone from doing something that's untoward. Uh, in addition, we send a fax, for example, electronically to the principal's office so that they know that resources are inbound as well. Can we jump in? Yeah, for sure. So one question that may occur to folks is how we support the, the, this back office operation, because DonorsChoose.org is not simply a, a Craigslist where teachers and donors are connecting uh, and, and making an exchange uh, without our needing to do anything. Uh, so how do we um, pay for our, uh, our industrial loft in the garment district and, and pay for our operations? Well, although we're a charity, DonorsChoose.org has a business model, and it centers on this option that you see here, which essentially invites the donor to either dedicate 100% of their donation just to the resources that they're funding. It's one click easy for a donor to say, I want 100% of my donation going only to the bus company, to the bus that's going to take these students to Washington, D.C. to see the Supreme Court argue a case. But there's a second option with a smiley face. And this smiley face is, is apparently persuasive because 90% of our donors choose to include a 15% fulfillment fee. That covers the work we do to validate the project, fulfill it, process the thank you package. Uh, and so as more and more classroom projects get funded on DonorsChoose.org, we become increasingly self-sustaining. Uh, we're able to pay more of our rent bill through uh, donors' inclusion of this optional fulfillment fee. And so actually when those Silicon Valley leaders uh, provided our charity with this round of funding, it wasn't just to open our website to every public school in America. It was also with the expectation that DonorsChoose.org would, within just two to three years, be able to cover 100% of its operating expenses through donors' inclusion of that fulfillment fee. For us, that break-even point is when $50 million a year of classroom projects are being funded through our site. So then the question is, all right, how do we get to 50 million? Because uh, right now, we're, this school year, we'll do about 13 million. Uh, next school year, we're planning to do 25 million. How do we get to 50? Well, we'll rattle off just a, a, a few ways that um, we've been using technology to bring donors to our website. One way uh, started with a blogger in Brooklyn about uh, three years ago. Uh, this blogger uh, does a blog called Tomato Nation. It's named after the tomato tattoo on her forearm. Um, and she does like a Dear Abby letter. Uh, she does Dear Abby advice, uh, writes about the Yankees. Uh, her readership happens to be a little bit politically left of center. And so when um, Bush won re-election, her uh, readers were uh, really disappointed. And this blogger wanted to do something to lift their spirits. So she went on to DonorsChoose.org and found a project for a class set of George Orwell's 1984. And she linked to that 1984 project from her blog and encouraged her readers to support it. It, it was going to be a way to uh, make themselves feel better by doing something good for a classroom. But their choice of which project on our site was a statement about where they thought the world was headed. Um, her readers, her blog readers, funded this project in seconds. And so the, the blogger behind Tomato Nation went on to, to pick more projects on DonorsChoose.org that she thought would be really appealing to her readers. And she joked that her readers wouldn't let her go to the bathroom for two weeks because she would link to a project and her readers would fund it. And she'd link to another project, her readers would fund it. And these readers were mostly of, uh, not of great economic means. Uh, they actually had to wait until payday before they could make most of their contributions, because they needed that paycheck uh, to deposit it to be able to make a donation. So we saw what happened with Tomato Nation, and we decided we should make that easier uh, for other bloggers to do. So we created this platform where uh, a blogger can create a page on DonorsChoose.org listing their favorite projects or projects that they think will appeal to their blog readership. So if I blog about environmental issues, I can create a page on DonorsChoose.org featuring uh, hiking, field trips, and environmental science projects. 
And then I can uh, put up a widget uh, showing progress toward getting all those projects funded. And most importantly, I can put uh, my page in competition with other bloggers' pages on donorschoose.org. Uh, and we can see uh, which blogger out there uh, is capable of helping the most students and inspiring the most generosity uh, from his or her blog readers. So last October, we put this uh, platform to the test. And we got um, TechCrunch and, and Gadget and Kara Swisher of All Things D and Fred Wilson of a VC and some of the top blogs uh, in the country to agree to throw their hats in the ring, create a page on donorschoose.org featuring classroom projects that would appeal to their blog readers, and uh, have what was, what was referred to um, on All Things D as uh, a blogger smackdown. And in fact, we, we did get some smack talking. Uh, uh, Michael Arrington of TechCrunch wrote a post saying that TechCrunch readers needed to fund more classroom projects than uh, Fred Wilson's blog readers of a VC.com. Uh, and then Fred Wilson had to talk smack back to Michael Arrington about whose readership was the most generous and who could help the most students through our website. And that was really awesome. And, and there's a, a technology leaderboard uh, that you can see uh, right there. And, and for whatever it's worth, uh, Fred Wilson managed uh, just to barely edge ahead. Um, the most interesting thing, though, we had these amazing blogs raising some real sums of money. You see TechCrunch raising 8400 bucks from its readers, and Gadget raising uh, 8400 bucks as well. Really, really exciting. Um, but the big surprise was how much Tomato Nation raised. So they had been the inspiration for this platform a few years ago. They came back to uh, participate in the Blogger Challenge. Uh, the blogger told her readers that she would dress up as a tomato and dance through Rockefeller Center if her blog readers funded all of the classroom projects that she selected for them. And this, blog reader, this blogger, Tomato Nation, who has uh, a Technorati authority that is a, a, a fraction uh, of that of, of Engadget, a fraction of the readers of Engadget and TechCrunch, she raised $100,000 from her readers, who, um, again, are of really mixed economic means. Um, and that was fascinating to us. And here's sort of one area where we'd love your thoughts and advice. Uh, for the next blogger challenge, we're trying to figure out what are the other Tomato Nation blogs out there that are capable of driving $100,000 of help to public school students? Because it's clearly not about readership, because Engadget and TechCrunch have way more readers. Uh, it's not about how many blogs are linking to you, because Tomato Nation wouldn't really register it by that measure either. Um, is, it, is it about blogs that still have a single voice that are more like a diary and, and not so much like a magazine with multiple authors? Is, is that what we should be looking for? Should we be um, using the number of messages posted by readers as a proxy for engagement? How can we find the other Tomato Nation blogs out there um, that we should really approach to make sure that they participate in the next uh, blogger challenge? And in fact, um, it is uh, Google that bestowed an award on uh, the bloggers who inspired the greatest number of readers uh, to give. So as you guys know, sometimes uh, when you build something for one purpose, uh, it ends up being used in another way that you never anticipated. Uh, and that's happened to us with the Blogger Challenge. We built this for the reasons Charles described and <laughs> envisioned bloggers using it almost exclusively. Uh, but we've had some other organizations essentially repurpose the same technology uh, for their means. And so, for example, uh, there's a local organization in New York City uh, called Mustaches for Kids. They actually have a bunch of different, they do this in a bunch of different cities, so you might have heard of them. And the way it works uh, is very highbrow. The way it works is that um, the participants uh, commit to a mustache growing contest for one month. They shave their faces clean at the beginning, and then they, they grow a mustache for one month and at the end have sort of an Olympic style showdown to see who has grown the best mustache. And uh, they have, a, as you can imagine, a lot of fun doing it. And in the past, they, and they, they always raise money for it. And the way they raise money is that the growers go out and ask their friends you know, with a sign up sheet to sponsor their mustache. It's kind of like team and training but with less running and more mustaches. So that, I'm just trying to paint a picture. And uh, what, what's really cool about Mustaches for Kids is that 
they got excited about the challenge functionality and said, we'd like to use this so that our growers and our donors can pick the projects that the money we raise goes to fund. Uh, and so, so, so uh, the New York team got together and said, we want to try to raise $25,000, $30,000, and they did so. And I want to show you the picture from the end of contest. These are our uh, generous donors. And so, you know, this is not the picture. These are not classic philanthropists uh, by any definition. But they had a, clearly a lot of fun raising money in very small amounts and having control over their giving. Uh, what happened next was the Mustaches for Kids uh, group in Charlotte, North Carolina, decided that uh, they wanted to try to one up the New York City group uh, by raising more money and also by using donorschoose.org to give their growers and their donors control over where uh, the money went. Uh, and so this is their challenge. And they set a goal of $25,000 and not only obliterated that goal, but are now over $50,000 in donations. Not all have cleared the site yet. So this was a really cool thing for us to see because you know mustaches for kids, this is a very uh, small, grassroots, you know, charity-oriented or, you know, communal organization that is some friends getting together to do something positive, and they repurposed our challenge functionality uh, to help make their experience uh, via the web a better one for their donors. One more um, way that we've driven donors to our site that we want to tell you about that will directly relate to, uh, to you and your company. And I'm going to um, do an abbreviated version because we want to get to the to this piece of technology that we're unveiling where we need your help. Um, and so I will simply say that there's a Wall Street Journal article about companies giving donorschoose.org gift certificates to their customers and clients. Uh, if, uh, if we give you a donorschoose.org gift certificate, and in fact, we have a gift certificate for each of you that you need to go spend. And, and when you spend this gift certificate that we're going to give each of you, um, you'll be able to spend it on the classroom project of your choice. And you'll become the honorary donor and get the thank you uh, from the classroom. Uh, last December, uh, Google decided that whereas they had given a, a digital picture frame to all 28,000 of their best advertising clients in the United States last holiday season, um, this, this holiday season, this past December, uh, Google gave a $100 DonorsChoose.org gift certificate to uh, the top 28,000 uh, AdWords and AdSense clients. It was totally awesome. Um, the redemption rate, so 29% of Google clients um, who received these gift certificates redeemed them. That is uh, record breaking. The average use of um, coupons when a supermarket gives them out is between 1% and 2%. Uh, when people go to uh, Best Buy or Circuit City and they get a cash back rebate, only 4% of people actually mail that in. Um, so a 29% redemption rate is record breaking. And as a result uh, of Google clients spending their gift certificates, you can hit the next slide, um, there are 150,000 students in public schools who have resources, uh, who have books, art supplies, field trips, as a result, as a direct result of Google clients spending their donorschoose.org gift certificates on projects, specifically on 5,700 classroom projects. So um, thank you. Another aspect of the way that we try to drive awareness of donorschoose.org to help bring teachers and, and um, perhaps more importantly for liquidity in the marketplace, prospective donors to the site, is uh, an area that we've been focused on lately. And it's in the general category of, of what I might call notification and syndication of our project listings. So one of the uh, pieces of functionality that I wanted to show you guys uh, was our new RSS feed functionality. You all, you all know about feeds. Uh, what we've enabled is uh, essentially a feed to be created for any criteria of projects on the site uh, so that a person can subscribe and be notified when new projects meet their criteria. So for example, uh, I'm going to select um, technology resources uh, that need between $1 and $200 high level of poverty, and I'm going to set the region to uh, Santa Clara County. Uh, 
And these are the search results of projects currently on the site. So someone might choose to fund these. But if they decided, you know, this is always of interest to me. I might, I might be perpetually interested in funding these projects, and I want to know about them without having to go back to the site, which is exactly the great thing about feeds. Uh, they can actually just create one. Uh, so for example, I can uh, add this to my Google Reader. And now you would be notified every time a project met these criteria. In addition, uh, what, we, what we've done to even further extend this is to uh, uh, enable the syndication, of our, uh, the syndication of our project listings. And we've done this using a, a very simple API that basically would let any other piece of software programmatically access the projects in our database, and essentially opening up uh, all these projects so they can be viewed not just on our website, but essentially syndicated anywhere. So what's our hope for this? Our hope is that uh, there's some basic scenarios that are, are simple and exciting, like a school showing all the projects from its teachers on their home page, or a school district showing all the projects from its teachers on their home page. Uh, but perhaps at the other end of the spectrum are, are even more inventive things that, that you know, we haven't come up with or we couldn't implement with our very small tech team. So perhaps somebody mashing up our project listings with Google Maps or perhaps somebody building a Facebook widget uh, to display projects uh, that a teacher has on their own Facebook page in order to drive awareness of their projects. So this is very exciting for us. We only released this recently. Uh, and you know, for, uh, for the engineers in the audience, um, we've tried to build this in a way that uh, you know, we, uh, we've adopted a, a very universal format. And it's easy. And uh, essentially, you could, you could do this server side by pulling data in with a JSON parser. Or uh, you can even do this in the client, uh, because it's JavaScript based. So that would enable um, cool mashups or something that's sort of very dynamic uh, in the client experience. One other thing I wanted to, to, to mention you guys to give a picture of our organization uh, is some of the tech infrastructure challenges we faced as a small business, a small charity, trying to operate uh, at scale on the internet. Uh, we have a pretty modern uh, technology stack. Um, we use Linux and Apache and Tomcat and Spring MVC framework, and we have a Postgres database and um, uh, decent machines running all this. But nonetheless, big spikes in interest due to media exposure in particular have been really hard for us to handle. Uh, we were really fortunate. We were on ABC 2020 uh, not that long ago. I believe it was October uh, or maybe November. And then uh, in December, Bill Clinton mentioned DonorsShoes.org on the early show. And uh, in fact, last October, Stephen Colbert and Craig Newmark from Craigslist got to talking about DonorsShoes.org on the Colbert show. And in all three of these cases, uh, suffice to say, a significant amount of traffic, much more than we normally handle, uh, got sent our way. So I guess uh, the, the challenge for us that we wrestle with, this is just some stats from the Colbert Show. And well, first of all, let me point out that the first spike is the uh, East Coast airing. The next two spikes are the, uh, the showings across the country. And then what happened was Stephen Colbert went on vacation for a week, and then reruns started. And it actually, <laughs> the, the, turns out his reruns generate a fair amount of traffic as well, uh, what we learned. Um, so, so what's significant here is that uh, I don't know exactly Google stats, but when you guys have a big day, um, maybe you do 2, 3x uh, your search traffic or traffic to Google News. But in our world, we have a big day, and we do 20x our normal traffic. And in fact, this is Colbert. When we were on ABC 2020, we believe the number might have been more like 100x. Uh, but frankly, it just blew us away, and we don't have the data <laughs> to show. The, the, the main point is simply, uh, you know, what's the best way for a small organization to handle the 99.99 percentile scenario where you get great media exposure, you want to be there for those visitors, but building out to handle that traffic, well, that would never make sense. It wouldn't be cost effective because most of the time, the overwhelming majority of the time, it would be wasted resources. And, and also, just to be clear for the techies out there, uh, we have a CDN. We do really heavy caching. And, and what is actually punishing us is personalized experiences like the My Donor page, and transactions, uh, which we do have to handle ourselves. So it's not, you know, this isn't as simple as saying, oh, you know, we just need to more aggressively cache our static stuff. Um, 
So one other thing I, uh, uh, I wanted to mention is that uh, uh, the, and this is sort of great news and been very reassuring to us, the, uh, it turns out the tech community uh, enjoys getting behind good causes. And they've been really generous to us. So for example, we benefit from a lot of donated software and services. Uh, we have e-procurement technology that's been donated by Arebo, which is uh, your neighbor in Sunnyvale. They build enterprise scale uh, electronic procurement and invoicing and reconciliation software, which is what we're going to be using to address some of the uh, back office stuff that I mentioned. Uh, also, we have donated bandwidth from a CDN. Uh, I don't know if those of you who know Joel on software, who's a popular blogger, uh, but he's donated to us his uh, Fogbugs software, which we use as a bug base and also for release management. And then, in fact, his software does such a great job of email integration that we use it to do uh, teacher-facing customer service. It's how our staff interacts almost like a CRM system with our teachers. So uh, we've been really uh, fortunate in this area. And also Salesforce.com, I shouldn't forget, has donated to us uh, greatly discounted uh, services of theirs. And uh, of course, uh, Google has made generous donations to us, not just the gift certificates. Uh, we also have a, uh, an AdWords account, which has a significant amount of, of donated dollars on it. And also, we make great use of some free products that you guys provide, like Google Analytics and uh, also JotSpot that we've been using for uh, 18 months. So uh, what we've been inspired by is this way that the tech community has gotten behind what we're doing. And we're hopeful that uh, the tech community also embraces, for example, uh, the new uh, syndication, the API, the access to our project database that we've provided, um, and can help us get the word out and build awareness um, and create innovative ways to um, deliver our project listings to prospective donors everywhere. So I'm going to close it and, and ask uh, you any uh, ask you for questions that might be on your mind. I'll just close in saying that we're in the, the Kitty Hawk stage of development. We're, we're on a nice exponential curve of growth, but we have not figured out how um, we're going to uh, really get to scale, how we're going to help not hundreds of thousands, but millions of students in public schools every year. Um, and we would really welcome ideas um, and, and help uh, in, in figuring out how DonorsChoose.org can fulfill its, its very real potential to, um, to help millions of, of kids in public schools. Three ways um, you can help. One is uh, just telling teachers about our website, uh, all the teachers you know, all the teachers you come in contact with. Second way is by spending the gift certificate that we're going to give you, because that's how you can bring a classroom project to life. And third, I just wanted to reiterate what Oliver was saying about our really keen hope that each of you will think about ways to, um, to present and distribute and do mashups with our project listings. Um, we have no idea how uh, our API can be used, but we, we suspect that um, if you put your imaginations to work, there might be some, some really cool things that flow out of this uh, and, and mashups and, and, and um, project distribution that might really impact the lives of a lot of students in public schools. So thank you so much for uh, lending an ear, and, and we hope you've got uh, a few questions. We should, sorry, uh, if anybody has to duck out, you, please come up and, or I want to put this somewhere so it's not distracting, but please come up and grab a, a $30 donor shoes.org gift certificate so you can help bring a classroom project to life. Hey, I think, uh, do you want to go first? And yeah. <laughs> Or we can repeat your question, either one. This is really interesting. I realize now that I was aware of your site. I think I have friends who are actually teachers with Teach for America who use it, but this was a very great demo. To me, it raises an interesting question, though, which is sort of the critique of public education. You know, the fact that we, you can channel so much money from private donors to public schools, isn't that something that our school should have anyway? Mm. And how do you address that question? Yeah, that's a fair question to pose. Are we letting government off the hook? Are, are we enabling private citizens to do what the, the system ought to be doing? Um, for us, it kind of boils down to uh, what happened in North Carolina when uh, the former governor, Jim Hunt, was going through DonorsChoose.org projects from his home county. And he came across a request for a class set of dictionaries. And he flipped out that there was a classroom in his home county that didn't have any dictionaries. And he called up local school officials to find out what was going on and to demand some change. And when we heard about that story, we decided to um, see whether that experience that Governor Hunt had was characteristic of our whole donor base. And 
it turned out that 60% of our donors said that they were more interested in public education reform of the whole system as a result of their experience on our website. Because for them, it was their first really vivid encounter, their first real like physical awakening to what's going on in our public schools. And they emerged from that website experience much more politically energized, civically energized, than if they had read uh, you know, a statistic in a newspaper article. And 22% of our donors said that they were likelier to vote in an election or in an education budget referendum as a result of their experience on our website. And, and that's um, what, what gives us this dream of, of a year or two from now, um, converting not just visitors into donors, but donors into civic actors and inviting somebody who has funded um, a, a field trip in Santa Clara County to click here to sign a petition, click here to tell your uh, elected representative about the need that you've just discovered, uh, click here to join your local PTA. Uh, so we actually see our website acting as an energizer of the, the, the whole population, especially those people who don't attend academic conferences or don't even have Teach for America friends, uh, really awakening those folks to what's going on in our public schools and in how the, the government could do uh, a better job of, of providing public education. Um, well, that was 75% of what I wanted to ask, and that was a great answer. Um, it's a real concern of mine. Um, uh, the other part is, what about having the students, often low-income students, writing these thank yous to these uh, Lady and Lord Bountifuls who are providing them with things that some of us think that the government should provide? Uh, has anyone, have any of the teachers or any of your staff or donors expressed any discomfort with that? I understand yeah. your reasons for doing so. Sure. We, um, interestingly, have had, uh, I got an email from a donor um, a week and a half ago who was saying, uh, I, I don't want to receive thank you letters for something that I think the government ought to be providing and that I'm, I'm providing as a necessity. Um, we don't get that reaction from our teachers. Um, in fact, we did. Um, sort of a focus group with our teachers uh, a year or two ago, a year ago, and asked our teachers if, if writing these thank you letters was uh, was a burden or, or a distraction from their teaching day, and we had almost this like near revolt from our teachers who said that even if we were going to throw out their thank you packages, they were going to send them in anyway because uh, number one, it's a wonderful teachable moment about the importance of writing thank you letters, which is often the difference between getting a job and not getting a job after a job interview when you write that follow-up thank you note. Uh, and number two was um, a literacy exercise where students cared a lot more about their grammar and their writing than if they were doing a homework assignment, yet one more homework assignment. Um, so our, our teachers overwhelmingly have said that um, it's, it's a wonderful teachable moment. Uh, we have even some teachers who've had so many projects funded and have had their students write so many thank you letters that they started attributing improvements in their students' uh, literacy scores at the end of the year to all the thank you notes that they wrote. Um, I don't know if you'd add anything to that, Oliver, but I hope that. Thank you. Sure. I was wondering if you guys have considered targeting uh, progressive sites and progressive bloggers. You were mentioning Tomato Nation as an example and wondering what the secret was. And <clears throat> not to stereotype, but us you know, bleeding hearts tend to try to put our money where our mouth is. So I was wondering if you guys are targeting them. Duly noted. Um, we, had, we had Daily uh, Cost do a, do a nice blog post about us, but that actually wasn't part of the blogger challenge. Um, so we'll, we'll take that as a note. and. and go back and, and uh, I'll also ask you for suggestions of other progressive blogs we should reach out to. Hi. Hey. Um, thanks a lot for coming today. Oh. Um, my dad works uh, at, he's worked at a bunch of different private schools which are located in a lot of poor, poor areas from Newark, New Jersey to Harlem, um, et cetera. And uh, there they have a lot of teachers that are working, you know, for very small salaries, not to mention the uh, books and all that, resources, very low. Obviously, the best place to start is at public schools here, and I agree with that. I was wondering if eventually, especially because a lot of private schools might have a religious um, tilt that would encourage donors of that religion, for instance, do you th mm -hmm. see yourself eventually expanding into that, as there are probably a lot of donors that would be more willing to give to a, a school that has shares their beliefs? Yeah. 
Well, right now we're open to, as you pointed out, just to public schools, and that includes charter schools. Um, that isn't so much a, a political decision to just be open to public schools as an operational focus uh, decision. And um, we, we are thinking carefully about how to extend our, our platform, um, not just uh, as to whether uh, Catholic schools would be the next best uh, expansion, but also thinking about whether um, an extension of our model ought to be to other frontline public servants, like social workers or police officers or doctors, um, or to schools in another country. Uh, and we're thinking through um, whether we ought to open source our platform or donate our code base to some initiatives uh, we can trust to get the model right. Um, we're, we're really wary of licensing our code base. Um, DonorsChoose.org itself expanding would be the most aggressive way to uh, extend our platform. Um, and those are all question marks. I'm afraid we don't have an answer yet uh, on that front. Thank you. Uh, I have another idea for raising funds. A, a lot of us support a political candidate, but aren't that exciting about giving money for ads yeah. um, to trash, um, say, the other Democratic yeah. candidate. Um, I, I don't know if you could have campaigns giving money in honor of, say, um, Barack Obama. And, so I okay. can't believe you're asking that question. Uh, that's awesome that you asked that. So we created, we used the... Uh, we've the, never met before. I, we've never met before. Yeah, I, wow. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so uh, that blogger platform that we described, we decided to use it to create a straw poll that makes a difference where um, you can go on to Barack Obama's page and see projects that uh, we put on his page that resonate with his platform or with his home state of Illinois and support a project uh, in, in, this, in, in this candidate's honor. And every donation that you make pushes your favorite candidate higher in this straw poll that makes a difference. Now, right now, we have Stephen Colbert actually beating um, all the other uh, candidates and beating them by a long shot. And that was in good part because of uh, the Stephen Colbert interview with Craig Newmark, where Stephen Colbert asked all of his viewers to make him number one in the DonorsChoose.org straw poll uh, that makes a difference. Though he was actually out in front in the number one spot even before uh, he asked all his viewers to, um, to totally put him over the top. I can't believe you. So there you go. Um, in talking about all the behind the scenes stuff that you guys are doing um, in terms of uh, channeling the resources from the donors to the teachers, it seems like you're making a trade off for inefficiencies and scalability with like having that accountability mm. um, for the donors. And have you, do you think you're at kind of the peak balance there or have you thought about making a trade off and being more efficient and scalable with higher risk potentially? It's, it's a really good question. It's something we wrestle with. Um, I think that, that there, there, first of all, may not be an all or nothing answer. Um, there may be ways that we decide that in order to go from, from 12 to 25 million and to scale the fulfillment, we have to uh, you know, cut back a little bit on some of the back office stuff. Uh, so I think we're always looking hard at that. Uh, one thing I, I, I will mention that we keep in mind, uh, and this is part of our challenge, is that I think for many of us, uh, when you operate as a consumer uh, or even as a vendor at a Craigslist uh, or an eBay, you know, it's a marketplace. You, you probably know that one in 20 transactions are going to go bad and someone's going to run off with your money and that's just the cost of doing business and it's, it's kind of akin to a real marketplace, you know, where sometimes you walk home and you get home and you open the thing up and it's not quite what you thought. And I think people have a certain tolerance for that in sort of purely commercial buyer beware marketplaces and potentially a different tolerance, um, a much lower tolerance when things are charitable or philanthropic. So for example, uh, one of the things we, we worry about is, you know, if we backed off some of these measures and something were to go wrong and that were to be discussed in the media, well, you know, people have a lot of options for making gifts. And, uh, if, if someone reads an article and there's some negative blog buzz about you know, one teacher who wasn't really a teacher because we didn't authenticate in that way because we backed off it to scale, um, 
Anyway, so the answer isn't no. The answer is we're, we're thinking hard about those considerations, but we're also trying to figure out what's the right balance because we think that people have different expectations when they're doing philanthropic things versus purely commercial things. Uh-oh. <laughs> hey, Oliver. Um, have you considered integrating with um, some of the activity stream technology out there, for example, uh, the controversial beacon technology by Facebook? I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that you want to share. Can you tell me how it might work? Oh, um, well, when, it, when somebody contributes to uh, a project, it would show up in their activity stream. So for example, I log on to Facebook and see what my friends are doing. One of the items would be, you know, Greg has contributed whatever, X dollars. Maybe that would be a private amount, maybe not. Greg has contributed money to, you know, some children in Los Angeles to give them textbooks or something like that. So that might be an interesting way to yeah. spread the message. It's the kind of thing that um, there are certain things like I don't know if I want all my friends to know that I just rented Ghost from Netflix, but <laughs> you know certainly uh, this kind of this kind of phenomenon is the the kind that needs to be shared, and so I think a lot of people would be amenable to that. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think that we uh, you know we have a small tech team, but we've uh, we've brainstormed about things. For example, in uh, in social networks, the big ones like Facebook, where there is this sort of event stream and announcement stream, and what could we do there? Uh, and, and we also think about stuff like, uh, you know, good, good well-meaning people who are humble uh, do like to sometimes show off their giving. So right. what's the Lance Armstrong bracelet equivalent right. for DonorsChoose.org? Is it a Facebook badge that shows your donations uh, or something like that? So I think, there's, I think there's a lot of promise there, and we're just trying to figure out what the best thing is to do and would love ideas and suggestions. Cool. Thanks. I think we've hit our hour, so but we'd love to engage with any of you who have questions uh, uh, right now. Thanks, definitely, guys. Yeah, definitely take a gift certificate. Yeah.